Federalism and separation of powers deals with all of those structural constitutional components in our federal constitution or our, our once former federal constitution, as the case may be. Um, we're going to be looking at one of those uh, issues today and the president's uh, obligation to take care that the laws be faithfully executed. I don't know, that seems to be a hot topic inside the Beltway these days um, and, and to the rest of us in the country. Um, but more importantly, uh, I want to invite you to be more active in participation in this practice group if you're not already. Uh, if you're interested in uh, helping with the programming or being on the executive committee, uh, send an email to me, John Eastman, J. Eastman at chapman.edu, or let one of the uh, staff at the Federal Society know of your interest, uh, and we'll circle back to you to get you looped into the activities of this particular practice group at some point. And with that, let me introduce uh, the Honorable Thomas B. Griffith, who is a judge on the D.C. Circuit Court of Appeals, uh, which I think deals something with the President's laws to... Uh, to faithfully execute the laws. Uh, Judge Griffith is our moderator. Thank you very much. Uh, Article 2, Section 3 of the Constitution reads in part, the President shall take care that the laws be faithfully executed. There is general agreement that the executive power includes authority to both execute the law and control its execution by others, but there has been a long-standing debate over the scope of the duty the word faithfully implies. George Washington famously said, it is my duty to see the laws executed. To permit them to be trampled upon with impunity would be repugnant to that duty. By contrast, Teddy Roosevelt wrote in his autobiography that the clause meant he could do anything and everything he wanted, absent express legal authority that instructed otherwise. Different strokes. We have assembled a distinguished panel of scholars who will discuss the scope of the president's duty to take care that the laws be faithfully executed. On the one hand, there is no dispute that a president has some discretion to decide upon the meaning of a law and even to determine whether to investigate, apprehend, and prosecute those who violate its terms. The pardon power acknowledges that prosecutorial discretion. And it is equally clear that there are instances when the president is free to choose not to enforce a law that might trench on his Article II powers. Seminal Supreme Court cases such as Chadha and Morrison v. Olson saw the Attorney General challenge the constitutionality of a law before the Supreme Court. We saw a similar argument weeks ago in Zivotofsky v. Kerry. In United States v. Windsor, Justice Scalia acknowledged that Quote, the Justice Department's refusal to defend legislation that, in its view, infringes upon presidential powers was entirely reasonable. But then he admonished the government that there was no such justification or any justification for abandoning DOMA, which raises the question of what justifications there might be for a president to refuse to enforce or defend an act of Congress that poses no threat to executive power. Few would argue that Jefferson's refusal to prosecute violators of the Sedition Act amounted to a breach of his oath of office. But what of the refusal of the current executive to enforce dep deportation laws that are admittedly constitutional? Or, following Justice Scalia's argument in Windsor, what of the de decision to enforce the provisions of DOMA while refusing to defend the act in court? To some, that approach has marked new boundaries in the scope of the president's take care duty. Today, we'll look forward to hearing from our panel as they discuss and debate the meaning of the Take Care Clause. Uh, we will hear from our panelists in the following order. We'll begin with uh, Ronald Cass, who's uh, Emeritus Dean of Boston University Law School. Uh, former, there are lots of things I could choose from on, on Ron, beside the fact that he was my criminal law professor for a few weeks before I, I changed, uh, uh, <laughs> had nothing to do with, uh, with Ron, was uh, uh, past uh, uh, chairman of the administrative law section of the American Bar Association, which uh, for, for many years was, a, was ground zero for, uh, for conservatives. Um, uh, following uh, Professor Cass, we'll hear from uh, Professor Christopher Schrader, the Charles Murphy Professor of Law and Public Policy Studies and the co-director of the program in public law at Duke Law School. Uh, Professor Schrader was also Assistant Attorney General for Office of Legal Policy uh, and at one time also headed the Office of Legal Counsel as Acting Assistant 
uh, Attorney General. Following uh, Professor Schrader, we'll hear from Professor Neil Devins, the Goodrich Professor of Law and the Cabell Research Professor, Professor of Government and Director of the Institute of the Bill of Rights Law and Director of the Election Law Program at the College of uh, William and Mary. And finally, we'll hear from uh, Professor John Baker, who's now Visiting Professor of Law at Georgetown uh, and Professor Emeritus of Law at uh, Louisiana State uh, University. Uh, each of the panelists will take five to ten minutes. My sole function while they are speaking is to tell them that ten minutes is up, and I, I, I will do that. Once they uh, each give their presentations, we'll invite a discussion amongst the panelists for the comments they've made, and then we'll at uh, some point open it, the uh, meeting to questions from the floor to continue the discussion. But we'll begin with Professor Cass. Thanks, Tom. Appreciate the introduction. Um, and actually, you would have gotten a very good grade if you'd stayed. Uh, I, I need to start with a, a true story. Uh, this story involves a fellow who's walking down the street one day, and he sees a gentleman who is followed by about 20 ducks. He goes up to the fellow and says, you, you realize that you, you've got a whole bunch of ducks behind you. And the fellow says, you know, they've been following me around all day. I just don't know what to do with them. At which point the, uh, the other fellow says, have you thought of taking them to the zoo? Great idea. Later on that afternoon, the same two people meet. And the, the fellow sees that there's still 20 ducks behind this other guy. And he says, did you take them to the zoo? The guy said, yeah, it was a great idea. Now we're on our way to the movies. <laughs> so, sometimes... Fairly simple instructions seem clear on their face, but uh, are, are received by people as having a degree of discretion that may not have been intended. When you, when you look at uh, the Take Care Clause, which appears, uh, as uh, Judge Griffith said, in uh, Article 2, Section 3, it appears in a context that doesn't suggest this is an open door to a wide-ranging discretion. It's along with resolving disputes between two houses about whether they should adjourn or not, uh, with receiving ambassadors and other ministers, with uh, commissioning officers of the United States, a, a bunch of, of duties that do not seem all that uh, uh, capacious in terms of the authority they give. On the other hand, there were both more and less constraining versions of the language that appears in the clause that were available in state constitutions at the time and that were also discussed by the people doing the framing. And the notes that are available to us don't indicate that much was uh, at stake in the eyes of the framers in the choice among these different formulations. They thought they were doing something that was fairly clear on its face, and they didn't want to uh, choose either language that was very clearly restrictive or very clearly open textured in terms of what it gave the president to do. The standard reading of the clause allows some scope of discretion to the executive, but, but not a, a great amount. And we see this in a variety of different contexts. We see this in the mandamus cases, which were limited to acts that were purely ministerial. There was a rel relatively narrow set of acts that were thought to be acts that courts could demand the executive to do. We see this in the reviewability cases as well. Uh, it is thought that a variety of types of executive action are subject to review, but there are some types, such as the decision not to uh, prosecute things or not to engage in certain types of activities, to allocate money that is not specifically appropriated for particular purposes, to given uh, resources. Heckler v. Cheney is one that deals with the administrative analog to a prosecutorial discretion as a matter of reviewability. Lincoln and Vigil deals with the question of a, uh, a body within the, the uh, Department of Health and Human Services closing down a program uh, for which money was available but not specifically appropriated. All of these suggest that there is scope for discretion in the executive, particularly when dealing with matters of resource allocation and choices that require some balancing of complicated factors, so long as the statute 
that gives presidential authority has not been precise in its constraints on the president. Uh, but there are two caveats here. One is that it is certainly within Congress's permit to say to the president, here is something you must do, here is something you must not do. And when the, the Congress gives a very specific direction to the president, the president is supposed to carry out the direction. The other thing that, to note here is that while it is clear there are areas where executive authority has been understood to be discretionary, and I will get back in a moment to prosecutorial discretion, it is quite the, clearly the case that the framers of the Constitution did not contemplate giving discretion to the president to engage in conduct that would punish enemies or opponents, that would change the very basic nature of the law that Congress had written, that would, had, on policy grounds, make the sort of selections that would naturally lie in congressional hands and would do so without the checks and balances that operate in Congress. Prosecutorial discretion is the quintessential case for executive exercise of discretion because it involves choices on priorities, because it involves resource constraints, because it involves a balance of competing factors. And it has been thought that the check on wrongful prosecution is in the judiciary. It is in the exercise of control over the case once it goes forward. But we look at things like the IRS scandal and we see the downside of broad prosecutorial discretion. If you have the ability to choose prosecution targets, you also have the ability to choose them in ways that clearly could subvert the democratic process. If you are punishing opponents through the use of prosecution, through the use of enforcement powers, there is nothing that is more inimical to the operation of our form of government the way it's designed than that, and prosecutorial discretion is something that should not be understood to authorize discriminatory enforcement. Those who are in favor of a very broad, open textured reading of the Take Care Clause should be very careful not to be authorizing either that sort of discriminatory enforcement or the sort of policy making that lies more in the hands of Congress than of the present. But we have to be careful about the tools we have to make that work. Because we have two sorts of tools at hand that are possible. One is the tool of impeachment, which is a very blunt tool. It's a very big tool. And it's not a tool that's going to be used for every misuse of office. We have every president has at some point engaged in activity that looks like an end run around congressional decision making. When Franklin Roosevelt struck the deal with Winston Churchill to trade destroyers for bases, he was doing that to get around the Neutrality Act. He was doing it very self-consciously to get around the law as it, as it stood. That is not the sort of thing, however, that we are likely to impeach a president for, even though it has serious implications for the rule of law. The second tool we have is litigation. And there, too, we have a problem because there are only so many sorts of questions that the courts are going to want to get involved in that pit one policy-making branch against another. In the end, what we depend on for the interpretation of this clause in a meaningful and yet sensible way is for the executive to exercise a sense of judiciousness in its discretionary decision-making and for the courts, when an executive gets too far out of bounds, to step in and say, this is as far as you can go and no further. In the end, we want people to understand that when we say take the ducks to the zoo, we mean leave them there, not take them to the movies afterward. And at the same time, we don't want to be counting the steps along the way. Thank you. So the president in the last uh, year and a half, two years, has engaged in a number of very high visibility 
actions that have been um, described as uh, undermining his response or violating his responsibilities to take care that the laws be faithfully executed, the deferred action on uh, the childhood arrivals, the uh, uh, extension of the employer mandate uh, uh, initiation date by the Treasury Department, uh, marijuana policies in states where laws permitting certain uses of marijuana have been marijuana prosecution policies and so on. These are very high visibility events. They've attracted a lot of attention. The first point I want to make, however, is that um, non-enforcement and selective enforcement of the laws is happening all around us all the time. Uh, these are just the tip of the iceberg. Uh, I'll give you another example that got some uh, press at the time, but not a lot of criticism, the massive shift of resources by the FBI after 9-11 away from investigating drug crimes and white collar crimes and shifting all of those resources and agents and assets over to counterterrorism. White collar crime prosecutions plummeted, drug, federal drug prosecutions plummeted. That was a conscious decision not to enforce those laws because of a priority setting uh, exigency in that circumstance, but a policy decision nonetheless. It wasn't random, it was, it was a policy which to which we all subscribed and agreed wholeheartedly that we should be more, doing more to fight terrorism and prevent the next attack, but it was a policy non-enforcement decision nonetheless. This kind of not selective non-enforcement um, is inevitable in light of the vast array of federal laws that are on the books that sanction people both civilly and criminally and have in toto an enormous scope. It's little, it would be literally impossible to execute all the laws all the time, so choices are always being made. Sometimes they're being made when administrations change. Elections have consequences, and one of the biggest consequences they always have is when a new administration comes in, it has different priorities that are reflected in their enforcement and prosecution policies. Uh, one very um, noticeable example with some regularity given the, the last changes in administration in, in my time has been in the Civil Rights Division of the Justice Department where the kinds of cases that are priority cases are quite markedly different from Democratic and Republican administrations and that reflects the policy views and the sense of what deserves the most attention of the, uh, of the differing administrations. Doctrinally, where does, uh, uh, in terms of the case law, where does uh, decisions, uh, prosecutorial discretion decisions uh, and decisions to selectively non-enforce uh, sit? Well, uh, Professor Cass has highlighted the two cases, Heckler and, and, and uh, Chevron. Chevron establishes a proposition. There's another meeting in another room about scaling it back, but here I'm just going to take it as a, as a data point the proposition that unless Congress has spoken to the precise question at issue, it's delegated that decision making to fill in the gaps, the ambiguities, the interpretations, the implementation steps that have to be made in order to translate legislation into actionable uh, um, prescriptions to the executive branch. Heckler was a case brought against the FDA for non-enforcement of its law, and in an opinion by Chief Justice Rehnquist, I think Justice Rehnquist at the time, um, he, he, the court concluded that the statute did not compel the prosecution of that matter and in fact had rested discretion in the executive branch to such a degree that the prosecutorial discretion that exists on the criminal side applies equally well on the civil side and is practically non-reviewable judicially because of the multiplicity of factors involved in those decisions and the lack of any firm benchmark to adjudicate differences among them. The grounding of prosecutorial discretion doesn't rest surely on the practical inevitability of its exercise. It was a founding generation presupposition. You can find support for the notion that the executive will exercise prosecutorial discretion in the writings of, of Wilson, of John Marshall, of Madison, of Jefferson, John Adams. And it's considered at some level a bulwark, a, a liberty enhancing bulwark 
under our system of separation of powers because it compels before government sanction can be used to, to restrict the liberty of an individual that all three branches be involved. That the, that the Congress enact legislation, that the executive make an independent decision to prosecute, and that the judiciary then adjudicate that case brought by the government. When the Constitution was written with the Take Care Clause in it, this background presupposition, I think, was part of the uh, common practice and understanding, and, and the, the, notion, uh, the, the notion of prosecutorial discretion can be traced throughout the, the uh, length of our history, uh, and its use, as I say, uh, occurs literally every day, all the time. Um, so that's sort of the full-throated defense of prosecutorial discretion. There are lots of ins and outs in this conversation. I'll wait to be pushed back and bullied by my panelists and questions uh, afterwards. So I am going to criticize the Obama administration, but for a different reason uh, than most here will, and that is for not going far enough. And I want to talk about the issue of the president interpreting a law he thinks unconstitutional, but nonetheless enforces it, and argue that the president ought not to enforce laws he think unconstitutional. So this was the issue Judge Griffith referred to with reference to the Defense of Marriage Act that the Obama administration enforced but did not defend the Defense of Marriage Act. And the reason for that was judicial supremacy, and that's what I'm going to attack in my few minutes here. So Attorney General Holder said there was an obligation to enforce but not defend because it was necessary to facilitate judicial review so that the courts, quote, should be the final arbiters of constitutional disputes. I think that view is incorrect. If the president thinks a law is unconstitutional, he has no obligation to defend it. He has no obligation to enforce it. This is the view Judge Griffith referred to at the beginning of the panel with reference to Thomas Jefferson and the Alien Sedition Act. So I'll just read what Jefferson had to say and say why I think it's right and then talk a little bit about the practical implications of that. So Jefferson said the following about the Alien Sedition Act. He declined to enforce the act because, quote, the obligations of an oath to protect the Constitution violated by an unauthorized act of Congress. He also said he had a, quote, duty to arrest the Sedition Act's execution in every stage. And with respect to the Take Care Clause, excuse me. He said the sedition law was unconstitutional and no that my obligation to execute what was law involved that of not suffering rights secured by valid laws to be prostrated by what was no law. So this is what Jefferson had to say, and I think this is clearly right. Presidents have interpretive independence to interpret the Constitution, whether the courts have read something into the Constitution or the courts have been silent on a matter. Presidents frequently criticize the courts, and if a president confronts an issue in which the courts have not addressed it, the president clearly has authority to interpret the Constitution. Whether you feel that's in the oath or in checks and balances, presidents clearly can interpret the Constitution. So if a president interprets the Constitution and concludes that an act of Congress is unconstitutional, there is no obligation to enforce it at all. It's not law. The faithful execution clause is to execute that which is law. Something which is unconstitutional is not law. There is simply no duty to enforce it and no duty to make a faithless argument in defense of it. And the notion that courts ought to settle these matters just seems plain wrong. It undermines both presidential authority and elevates the courts in ways that are inappropriate. Uh, the courts have limited jurisdiction. The executive may take action that is not subject to judicial review because there is no standing for anyone to bring a suit. And the executive may deny a case coming to court by interpreting the Constitution and concluding that a law is invalid or an administrative initiative is invalid, so there's never a case that comes to fruition. So on the law here, and on the constitutional law here, I think there's clearly no duty to execute, no duty to defend the law. Then what about the policy ramifications? Because that is, of course, a major concern of the panelists here today, 
with reference to presidents going too far and not adhering to the take care clause. What are the risks of the president interpreting the Constitution and concluding that there is no obligation to enforce or defend a law he deems unconstitutional? Here, I think there is not much in the way of risk because there are bureaucratic constraints that will prevent the Department of Justice from seeking to find laws that are unconstitutional. Uh, Professor Schrader might want to comment on this at some point, but the incentives of the Department of Justice are very court-centric. They are incentives that speak to the defense of laws, the enforcement of laws, because for the Justice Department, it's critically important that the courts have as much power as possible, because the more power the courts have, the more power the Justice Department has. So it's not shocking that there are very few examples of the Justice Department seeking to go into court and claim a law is unconstitutional. There are just a handful of examples. Uh, for his part, the president is not looking for these controversies either. The president does not have much of a constitutional vision for the most part. There are very few examples of presidents intervening in cases before the court by the Justice Department and taking a position that forces the Justice Department to modify its argument, particularly with respect to a non-defense situation. Uh, presidents in general want power centralized in the Justice Department. They don't want it dispersed among the agencies. It's much easier for the president to have his policies advanced through a strong Justice Department, and that means a Justice Department that is going to be very much court-centric and want to defend laws. And then finally, the president is also constrained by this reality of panels like this, that if he claims something is unconstitutional and refuses to enforce it, People will claim that the president is overreaching. There will be talks of presidential overreaching, talks in Congress of overreaching in the press. There'll be a lot of political, public elite pressure on the president not to travel that road. For all these reasons, I think presidents ought not to enforce laws they think unconstitutional. This will rarely happen, but when it happens, it's better for the president to be honest and to say this law is unconstitutional. Not only will I not defend it, I will not enforce it. This morning, Justice Scalia, in his talk on the Magna Carta, oh, I shouldn't say the, right? <laughs> on Magna Carta, reminded us that the rule of law is an ideal that has not always been reached. And in fact, through the centuries, it's been one struggle after another as those who hold political power attempt to subordinate the rule of law to their own will. So in our age, what is it? And we constantly go through this from administration to administration. And I want to make three points, the first of which Ron has actually already made. Whatever criticisms people in this room may have of the Obama administration, this is not the first administration to overreach. The second is, if we want to really ground an understanding about all of this, we have to talk more about the administrative state. That's what sets all of these possibilities up and there the responsibility for that mess lies with Congress, not with the president. And the third point I want to make is that having said both of those things, there really is something different about what this administration is doing. Can we distinguish between non-enforcement, which I agree, I don't disagree with anything you said other than that this is just a case of non-enforcement. And my third point, I want to argue, this is much more than non-enforcement. Okay, so Republicans and Democrats, whenever their party is out of the White House, the person in the White House is awful. That's <laughs> always the case. But if we're really to look at this, we've got to step back, and we can't take that kind of a partisan viewpoint. That's why we had invited Jonathan Turley here, because l alone among liberals, basically, he's been outspoken in criticisms of this administration and saying to liberals, look, these are precedents you're not going to like when a Republican gets in office. It's almost reminiscent of some of the things that were bipartisan during the Watergate period. But back then, the media was focusing on the rule of law. We don't hear much about that today. Just think about, to be fair, just think about some of what the Bush administration did. I mean, we, we know there was a lot of Republican criticism about the war on terror. 
But just think about it in the domestic realm in which the Secretary of the Treasury, Paulson, made these power grabs. And right now, this week, ongoing, still in this town, in the uh, Court of Federal Claims, is Hank Greenberg's suit against the government for grabbing the equity claims of AIG without proper compensation. So there's a lot there that one can criticize in every administration. So second point, administrative state. This is where it all derives, because this is the attack on separation of powers. And after all, this is the separation of powers section, so we should talk a little bit about that. Remember, the progressives hate separation of powers. Read Woodrow Wilson. It slows down democracy. And how are they going to change that? The 17th Amendment to speed things up, take away the control that the states had over the Senate. Secondly, we need technical expertise. We want to move these things into bureaucracies, which also means moving them out of political accountability. Judge, you mentioned the Chada case. The Chada case involving legislative veto was a wonderful invention by Congress to make sure that it could maintain control while avoiding accountability. This was not just Democrats. This was not just liberals. It is across the board almost, unfortunately, in the Congress. This is the root of much of the problem because unlike the king versus the barons, and the king had most of the power, under separation of powers, it is distributed. So it is a problem not just of power in the executive branch, it's a problem of the power in the other political branch, and it is the interrelationships between them that is causing much of the difficulty. And much of the di difficulty lies in this. As the Federalists said, if you have too many laws, you don't have the rule of law. Why? Because you have all this discretion. That's what the real problem is. And I spent a lot of time on the federalization of crime. And Republican administrations are as bad as Democratic administrations when it comes to their use of discretion in this area. The last point has to do with how this is different. I think the most starkly poignant feature of this administration is the president's claim that I will work with Congress, but if they won't work with me, I'm going to act. I don't know that anyone has ever before made that claim. Maybe in time of war, certainly FDR really did it, but I don't know that he made those public claims. Even Truman, when he grabbed you know, the steel seizure case, he went to Congress. Oh, and by the way, they didn't do anything. And the court slapped him down. They understood the difference between executing the law and making the law a huge difference. Now, what I suggest is the second point is not only is this rhetorical claim important because it's educating the public, which doesn't know much about the Constitution anyway, to think that a president can rule this way. Rule. We don't have members of government who rule. They're supposed to govern. There's a big difference between rule and govern. But it's not just, second point, not just non-enforcement. It's undermining the law. So for instance, on the Central American surge that came into the country, Homeland Security said, we had no idea this was coming. January 24th appeared in the federal, whatever it is, the register, a, a, an RFP for private contractors to be available to escort an expected surge of Central American youth coming into the country. Months before the surge, they knew it was coming, and they, we didn't know it was happening. That's undermining the law. That's not just failure to enforce. But all of this should not come as a surprise because what's really going on here is the deliberate creation of crisis. Remember, Rahm Emanuel's famous line, never let a, a crisis go un, unused, unwasted. Don't waste a crisis. Where does that come from? 
classic Sala Alinsky. Classic. That's what this is about. Because a lot of what actually happens, what they actually end up doing, like on the marijuana thing, I mean, justice shouldn't have been and wasn't enforcing possession of marijuana cases anyway. It was all symbolic and rhetorical. But this claim together with they can rule and undermining the law creates a crisis and pushes this, the country into constant government by crisis. That's exactly what the framers tried to avoid because they understood that democratic governments fall apart because of crisis. So they built in through separation of powers and federalism, stability, stability. This is the only administration I have ever known of that has as its purpose destabilizing the republic. Remember, this president said as a candidate, I want to be a consequential president. You may think he's incompetent. He's not. You're judging incompetence and effectiveness by an end that we've all agreed on until recently. But if your end is disruption, he's perfectly competent. Thank you. OK, my, my job now is to sit down and let the, uh, the, the panelists speak amongst themselves. I, I, I noticed, uh, Professor Schrader, can I ask you to start? Because I noticed you were busy. Taking a few notes? You were busy <laughs> taking notes. Uh, so why don't you take it, uh, kick it off, Chris, and we'll go from there. Sure. Uh, just a couple of quick um, points by way of uh, reply to some of Professor Baker's remarks. First, I think it's important to remember that not liking a precedent, and I don't like some of the things the president has been doing, is not the same as thinking it's unconstitutional. We may be in a very difficult place because of the pathologies of the administrative state and the over-federalization, over-criminalization at the federal level, and I think that's right. <laughs> but there's a difference between reaching that conclusion and coming to a sober conclusion that the, the framers actually prohibited that conduct from occurring. And I, that's the point that I just don't see at this juncture. I think the, the, the roots of prosecutorial discretion are extremely deep. The practice is long and robust. The, the case law is robust. Let me put it this way. Were I a presidential advisor, suppose some president came to me and asked me in the Office of Legal Counsel, is it OK for me to go ahead and defer the, the deportation proceedings of childhood arrivals, on the, on the present state of the law, I think that would be an easy opinion to write. Yes. I'm, you, I'm if, not disagreeing. If you look at the four pages of Secretary Napolitano's opinion, it reads like a classic situation that, the, that INS before them and now the Department of Homeland Security has written reflecting a humanitarian concern. The Supreme Court in Arizona versus the U.S. described the immigration law as granting an extraordinary amount of discretion to take equitable and humanitarian factors into account. The only basis on which you could say this is distinct from those historical instances are the number of people involved. But that can't, I, I don't know where in the Constitution there's a rule that if the president acts in a way that affects too many people, he's violated the Constitution. So that's my, that's my first point. The second one, and I'll, then I'll, I will stop. I have some. So there is a difference between executing the law and making the law, but in a, the world in which we operate, that distinction is a lot more problematic than you would think. If Congress has enacted a statute that grants discretionary authority for the administ for the an administrative agency or the president to fill in the gaps to write the regulations that actually make the statute operative, those regulations, to all intents and purposes make the law. It's not the Clean Air Act's instruction to the Environmental Protection Agency to have it set ambient air standards at a level requisite to protect the public health that is an operative legal standard. It's the Environmental Protection Agency's implementation, execution of that provision that operates in that way. And I agree that this makes, can make us very uncomfortable. I just don't see the argument for, for unconstitutionality at this juncture. I'm not making one. 
Go ahead. Well, D just speak into the microphone. Look, the, the, the point, when lawyers and law professors talk about unconstitutionality, they think in terms of something going into the courts and having a court declare it. That's not the argument I'm making at all. I'm making a much more serious argument that this is undermining the whole foundation of the Constitution. Well, I, I think we have to distinguish two different sorts of things. One, Chris spent a lot of time talking about prosecutorial discretion, and I think rightly said that there are some forms of prosecutorial discretion that really are inevitable. You have limited resources, you have a huge range of potential uh, enforcement targets, you have a huge range of things that uh, are going to be on the potential list of things that could be prosecuted. You can't prosecute them all. At that point, you do have to make judgments, and every administration makes those judgments, and we've contemplated that with every administration. I think that, that is a different thing, however, from making a conscious choice in certain cases to select targets on bases that if they were made publicly known would be seen as improper. And again, come back to what we have right now on the public record about what happened to the IRS, that is a, a misuse of the right to set priorities. So I think we have to distinguish those. Second, uh, one of the points that John makes, that John makes, I think is very important. Uh, John's point about over-criminalization. We have a regulatory structure which cranks out tens of thousands of pages of new rules every year. And we have perhaps 10 to, to 100 times as many pages of potential criminal violations on the regulatory side as we have on the statutory side. That provides a framework where not only are you going to have to have discretion and enforcement, but you have the sort of ri constant risk as a citizen that you're going to be caught in something you're unaware of, unprepared for, and may never have, even if you've known about it, may never have thought it applied to you. We have a case, the Yates case, in front of the court this year that deals with that problem. But that is a very serious problem, and talking in terms of old-fashioned prosecutorial discretion kind of misses the fact that we live in a different world today. Uh, I'm, I'm not sure that, that there's an easy answer for that, but I think that's something we all ought to be aware of. Professor Devins. Yeah, just, just a couple of thoughts. Um, so the first is with respect to checks and balances and separation of powers, it's not often going to be the courts that are going to be the engine of policing checks and balances, as uh, John Baker suggested. It's going to require pressure from Congress to check the president. Uh, and the problem is that the president has very strong incentive to expand presidential power. Whenever the president advances his policy agenda, he makes arguments to expand presidential power. There's a huge collective action problem in Congress. Members trade off institutional interests in order to pursue local interest all the time. Congress being polarized as it is today, the president's party is not particularly interested in checking presidential power. So there are real limits in what Congress can do. Now, of course, we have a new Congress. That's a Republican-controlled Congress. And it's quite likely that we will see greater pushback against the Obama administration than the previous Congress, and perhaps checks will be applied through oversight and other mechanisms available to Congress, appropriation bills, and whatnot that were not there before. Uh, but to echo some of what's been said before, you have to draw a distinction between what courts can do versus what the people putting pressure on their officers can do, pressure on lawmakers in particular, uh, and what Congress is willing to do itself. Uh, over time, the president has always expanded his power because he has incentive to do so. Consistently, uh, Congress does not have incentive to expand and defend its turf. Uh, there might be a little bit of an improvement with the uh, new Congress, uh, but in general, uh, the presidential power will always expand, and maybe this will be a fairly depressing note to end this comment. One would anticipate that whoever the next president is will go further than President Obama went. Uh, again, trying to be even-handed on this, when you're talking about Congress and what it will do, remember, it was Senator Mitch McConnell who proposed two years ago that Congress give the president the ability to simply raise the debt so that he would give up the Congress's main weapon. And you just wonder, what happened? I mean, what are you doing there? I mean, what do you think this is about? <laughs> 
It, it's separation of powers. You don't give your powers away like that. Again, go back and read Federalist 48. The legislative branch is the most dangerous. It will always be scheming. And it's not so much that the president is increasing his power. In fact, the reason I think that the Obama administration in part makes a lot of these outrageous statements is because they really don't have power in certain areas. So for instance, on the immigration thing, there was all this talk about vast amnesty and there's some element in there, but it's a lot more restricted than the fear was. And, and again, on the marijuana situation, change of policy was not really on the ground any different. It's the rhetorical aspect of this is so important. But when presidents have to rely on rhetoric because they can't get anything done, that's not a healthy state either. What's becoming more powerful is the executive branch. But the president, we know, doesn't have control over administrative agencies that are independent agencies. And even if you've ever worked in any of the agencies, I remember I was working with one agency USAID, and after the Democrats took over the Senate, we had John Bolton scheduled to speak, and all of a sudden there's all this dithering. Would the Democrats like this? They said, wait a minute, we still have a Republican president. No, but they control our budget. It's all about the money. That's where the control is. That's how Congress maintains its power, by appearing to be incompetent, but still getting what it wants. I, I want to encourage, I, I want to encourage uh, some some members of the panel to respond to Professor Devin's point, which I thought was rather provocative, but maybe no one else thought it was, the notion that uh, a president doesn't have a duty to enforce uh, statutes that he thinks unconstitutional. Is that, is that maybe that's not provocative. I, well, I, I'm happy to, to take a you. crack at that. I, I think there's a, a big, I think there's a big difference between a president deciding not to enforce a part of a statute that he believes unconstitutionally impinges on executive authority. Yeah, that, but and, I don't believe it was and, so restricted. No, okay. no, I, yeah. I think that, that is justified because if the president doesn't take that seriously and the president doesn't enforce it, th there's nobody else to do that. On the other hand, if we're talking about a law that doesn't uh, impinge on presidential authority, a law that the president thinks is unconstitutional for other reasons, I, I think that is one the president is bound to enforce until it is struck down by the courts. And I think it sanctions a form of lawlessness to say that the uh, administration gets to pick and choose. When Chris was talking about setting uh, uh, priorities, when you look at the cases on mandamus, you look at the cases on reviewability, you look at the cases on prosecutorial discretion, they all have justifications for the court staying their hand based on the inevitability of making these decisions, the complexity of the decisions, the nature of the decision being outside the ambit of what courts do. Courts decide what's constitutional. That's what courts do. And I think to say that the, uh, the Justice Department or individual prosecutors get to decide when to enforce the law based on their view of it as a general proposition is a dangerous uh, proposition. I, I thought that didn't need responding to, though. <laughs> well, go ahead. Ron, I didn't think I was going to disagree with you on anything, but I do disagree with you on this because, first of all, uh, each of the branches is supposed to have its own constitutional uh, responsibility to make interpretation. And the notion that that's what courts do, it's not only what courts do. That is, the other branches have a responsibility. The question is, do the courts have obviously more effect when they declare something unconstitutional. Yes, that doesn't mean that Congress doesn't have a responsibility. As Justice Scalia is constantly criticizing in speeches, Congress by saying, we'll just throw something up and see if they will hold it constitutional. You know, he says, well, if they're gonna do that, why should we defer and, and presume constitutionality if they don't take constitutionality seriously? That's one thing. Secondly, Congress does everything it can to avoid a veto of things that the president ought to have a shot at vetoing. They give him these huge bills that are must pass and they bury things in there so he can't veto them. That's certainly an end run around the president's uh, right and responsibility in exercising the veto power. That's why we had presidential signing statements and other things. I think that a, that a president who thinks 
for good constitutional reasons that he ought not to enforce a law should so state and give another opportunity to defend the law. But that was Justice Scalia's point in the Doma case, that there are circumstances in which you can do this, but you didn't give any good reasons. I, I think, John, that there's a big difference between uh, saying that Congress ought to try to see if it's behaving constitutionally when it passes a law, and saying to an individual executive official, once a law is passed, once it's signed, once it's on the books, you still get to decide whether you think it's constitutional. I, I think that challenges the rule of law, and I think we ought to have the executive officials enforce the law when it's, when it's clearly within their domain. If you give to the antitrust officials in justice the job of enforcing the antitrust laws, and a, a new chief doesn't say, I'd rather prioritize Section 1 claims over Section 2. I'd rather look more at uh, uh, conspiracy than at monopolization by a single firm. That, that's within the realm of, of making resource choices. If he says, I think the antitrust laws are just fundamentally bad because they actually take property, and I think they do it without due process, and I'm not going to enforce them. I'm I, think that, I think that is not an appropriate judgment. I'm not talking about a cabinet officer or a lower officer having that responsibility. I'm talking about the president. If the president makes that decision, that's something different. It, it, if, it, if I could just add yeah, a couple of things, uh, since I guess it was You Biden, started it. Yeah, I started it, uh, <laughs> but you picked up on it because you knew it was a court point, right? So you wanted to go with it a little. Um, yeah, I, I am talking about the president uh, uh, himself. Uh, but also, you know, I do not think the executive is subordinate to the judiciary. And if the executive is not subordinate to the judiciary, has the power to independently interpret the Constitution, it can't be exercised only at the veto point when a prior president may have signed the bill. Uh, the president who inherits the bill has to have an opportunity to interpret it himself and not be bound by a prior administration. The idea that a prior administration can tie the hands of a subsequent administration doesn't make sense to me. The president has the power to interpret has the power to act on that interpretation. If he did not have the opportunity to veto it initially, he has the opportunity not to enforce it. And if people don't like that, they can go after him in the ballot box, they can go after him in other ways, and for that reason it's going to be exercised extremely infrequently. Would it, but are you suggesting then that if the president does sign the act, that, that, no, that I, changes I the, the dynamic? I think the president can still change his mind. And he, he, Certainly, the president cannot okay, bind that, a You've got to find a different ground for that, because you just said... Yeah, yeah, yeah. The president you, cannot the, bind a future administration. It's a little trickier to say the president cannot bind himself. Right. But, uh, but you know, let's... Uh, let's hear it. So what's the trick? How does, how does he do it? Because the president uh, has the power to independently interpret. He can uh, come across uncovered evidence, just like the courts can reverse themselves. The president should be able to reverse themselves, right? Why would we leave the Supreme, give the Supreme Court the power to reverse itself and not give the president the power to reverse himself, right? I think we should ask Professor Schroeder because he was in the Office of Legal Counsel and their job is to maintain a kind of stability in terms of uh, the executive branch's understanding of the law, correct? Do you want to comment on that? Sure. Um, a couple of things. Just, so as a matter of practice, which I know will not be satisfactory for people who want bright line, full stop kinds of rules of procedure, as a matter of practice, the Department of Justice sets a very high bar for deciding that it would recommend not enforcing a statute on the grounds that it's unconstitutional. So state this another way. The overwhelming presumption when a case arises on the doorstep of the Department of Justice is it's going to enforce the law, period. <laughs> so when it makes those decisions, it does so with consideration of a number of factors, one of which is a very strong conviction that the judgment that the statute is unconstitutional is correct. It, it's not a 51-49 kind of decision. The, the most numerous um, declinations to enforce that happened in a compact period of time was immediately after the Lopez decision in 1995. The court found for the first time in, what, 37 years that there was a restriction on the scope of the federal commerce power. And they defined the deficiency in a way that it became immediately evident as litigation arrived on the doorsteps of the Justice Department that a lot of statutes didn't meet the Lopez test that were on the books. They had been written in a window of time when this was not 
thought to be a constitutional um, line to be drawn. And so I think it was something, I think Seth, Seth Waxman himself signed something like 12 or 14 letters to the, to the um, Congress notifying them that they were gonna refuse to enforce uh, statutes. And I think if you look at those cases, the judgment was decidedly correct. These cases were not gonna withstand judicial scrutiny once they went to the court. So what you were in effect doing is dragging a private litigant through the process and expense of going to a court in order to have that judgment validated. So that's one kind of circumstance that draws the department to the judgment that there are some instances in which it's permissible. And I wouldn't say compelled. I don't think the president has an obligation to refuse to defend these cases, but I do think that's a choice that he can make, which makes it more complicated. But you take other circumstances. Thomas Jefferson had his prosecutors stop the prosecution of, of people under the Alien and Sedition Acts when he took office at a time where he was probably wrong. The courts thought the, the Alien and Sedition Acts were constitutional. In his independent judgment, the courts be damned in that circumstance. He thought the statute uh, transgressed the First Amendment and he told people to stand down from prosecuting it. So it's, it's difficult for me to say, never say never in, in the um, area of whether the, the the president should always enforce a law, even if he has a firm belief that it's unconstitutional. But I can tell you, and the DOMA case was the product of, I won't uh, disclose conversations uh, for internal to the Justice Department, but there's a huge amount of conversation about that and it was about the, that ultimate decision and it all turned very heavily on this notion that the department's mission is to defend acts of Congress, almost reflexively except in very unusual circumstances. Ron, I want to go back. You know, many of these disputes, the, the framers never intended these disputes to be litigated. And so, for instance, on the War Powers Act, basically, that's not going to get litigated. And that's going to be a struggle between the two branches. And the president, I don't know about this administration, but every other administration has said that at least certain parts of the act are unconstitutional. So what's the president to do? Apply, uh, abide by the act if he thinks it's unconstitutional, or leave it to a fight between the president and the Congress. That's what separation of powers is about. There isn't line drawing in a lot of these areas. It's going to be a fight. Well, just, uh, just quickly on this, because I know we have audience questions to get to, but there's a big difference, again, John, between the president saying, I'm going to defend presidential authority that I think is constitutionally uh, required to lie in my hands. From to, to find defending executive power authority. And that's what's going on with the War Powers Act. Every president since that has been passed has said they believe it to be unconstitutional. And the, there's a, a huge weight of authority for why it is unconstitutional. It's one thing to say that I'm not going to cede presidential power. It's another to say in a separate area that I'm not going to enforce a law on the books. So let me get to, to Chris's point here. When Chris is describing what Seth Waxman did, it's perfectly appropriate when the, when the Supreme Court has just handed down a case saying, here is the law, and you can see that this doesn't meet it. Post Chata, you know, one house vetoes are unconstitutional. You don't have to defend the next one house veto that comes along. It's very clear you have a, a rule as you did post Lopez. Doma is a different case. Doma is a case that's a, a highly contestable and highly contested case where you have a division in the viewpoint of whether it is or is not constitutional. And there, it, what was being made was a political judgment. Uh, it's a political judgment that is in legal garb, but it's a political judgment on that case. And I think it's a different sort of judgment. You, we can talk about whether that's something that people should or shouldn't do, but that's the sort of role the Justice Department should or shouldn't be playing. But I think that is different in kind from the sort of judgment that was made post so, But why is it a political judgment and not a legal judgment? When Thomas Jefferson, as uh, Chris was talking about before, does not prosecute under the alien and sedition laws and uh, pardons everyone previously convicted under the laws, uh, does he act inappropriately because that's outside the scope of presidential power and involves individual rights, or does he act appropriately because he's entitled to interpret the Constitution and entitled to reach a judgment different than the courts. Why wouldn't the Obama administration be entitled to say, we can interpret the Constitution, reach a judgment about the DOMA, 
and we don't know whether the courts will reach the same judgment as us, and we are not bound by their judgment. We have the power to independently interpret and act on that interpretation rather than to transfer that power to the courts. Part of the executive power includes the power to interpret the Constitution and act on that interpretation. With that, let's, let's invite uh, folks, other folks to get involved in the conversation. So if you'd please line up at the uh, microphones, and of course the same ground rules, you introduce yourself, and uh, questions, not speeches, and uh, if there's a particular member of the panel you want to direct your question to, please do so. so Let's start uh, with this gentleman in the middle, and then we'll move from there. Paul Johnson of New Jersey. Uh, thank you for an interesting discussion. Enjoyed it. I have a quick comment and a question. Um, comment to you, Ms. Uh, Professor Schrader. You mentioned earlier about the immigration issue with the unaccompanied minors um, and the president's involvement with that. It may not be that what happened um, violates any provision in the Constitution, but I think his involvement may be considered a high misdemeanor and probably impeachable. So um, you can comment later about that. My question is to Professor uh, Devins. Devins. Uh, Devins. Devins. Hi. Um, you mentioned uh, during your uh, remarks about uh, DOMA and how that was uh, <laughs> struck down. But you also talked about um, your actual point was that the president has, a du I guess, a right, perhaps a duty, not to defend laws that he finds to be unconstitutional, or I guess even enforce them. And I, I'm not sure where I come down on that. It's, it's, it's an interesting question, but um, I think it's a problem with stability over time. I don't think you want different presidents not enforcing laws, but I'm not, not sure. But on the question of DOMA, the um, Supreme Court uh, struck down Section 3. Now suppose uh, we had a President Romney who was in office at the time when it came down. And presumably, uh, President Romney would have been in, for, uh, in favor of enforcing DOMA. Would he have had the, the, the duty to basically ignore the court because he believed in it? And he says, well, it was, you know, the act of, it was an act of Congress passed overwhelmingly. I believe in it. And the court may disagree, but my informed judgment is that it is constitutional and proper uh, public policy. Yeah, I mean, uh, this is a great question. Um, if the court renders a decision that uh, is sort of binding to the parties. Uh, the president cannot ignore it with respect to the parties. If the president <coughs> thinks the court's decision is incorrect and has the discretion to create a new case um, by, you know, acting contrary to it, uh, you know, just as uh, Abraham Lincoln's view on the Dred Scott case, um, I think presidents can act that way. So I think it's a question of whether there's a judgment that the president would be disregarding which would be problematic, or the question is whether the president can operate outside the scope of the judgment. Okay. Thank you. Let's go over to the side here. Yes, ma'am. Uh, Julie Blake from the West Virginia Attorney General's Office. I have a question generally for the anyone on the panel who feels like chiming in. Uh, some of the specific acts Can you hear me? I can't tell. Go ahead. Yeah. Okay. Some of the um, particular executive actions you've t touched on, immigration and some of the Affordable Care Act, seem qualitatively different from non-enforcement because they prospectively license or encourage conduct that appears contrary to the statutes. Uh, in the opinion of the panel, does any of that seem to cross into a separate territory of an assertion of a suspending or dispensing power? We'd like to take that. Well, that was my point, that this is fundamentally different from non-enforcement. So as a, just as a matter of uh, what the, the uh, Deferred Action for Childhood Arrivals does, it doesn't operate prospectively in the sense of inviting new minors to come into the United States in order to take advantage of it. One of the, re one of the requirements is that you have been a resident for five years prior to the issuance of Napolitano's order. It does suspend enforcement of the, the deportation rules that would otherwise apply to a whole class of people, but it doesn't declare that those people are not in violation of the law, which I would think would be one distinction between a dispensing power argument and a non-enforcement type argument. That's a technical difference that practically it results in the same thing. It results in the individuals being able to stay in the country but as people have observed in a, if 
should a president follow President Obama who felt differently about deferred action and rescinded that order, certainly a, a, a great number of those people would be subject to deportation immediately. You'd have some reliance interest arguments that you'd have to worry about. Um, but certainly he could, that could be changed. And the person's status has, the person could not claim, but I'm here legally because of the order that Secretary Napolitano issued. Whereas under a dispensing situation where the president has authorized conduct and then the court holds contrary to the dispensing power, that, that authorization trumps an otherwise operative statute, that person's legal status has been changed. That's why dispensing power is a big problem uh, constitutionally. I think that principle is also a bedrock background assumption of the Constitution. Uh, and in some, and admit in some tension with uh, prosecutorial discretion. But the, the pattern and practice and the bedrock nature of prosecutorial discretion uh, leads me to think that um, in situations which can be well described within conventional understandings of the way prosecutorial discretion operates both functionally and in terms of the considerations they're taking into effect and the procedural effect of the order that an action like the immigration deferral uh, falls comfortably on the discre prosecutorial discretion to the side of this tension. If that were all, you'd have an interesting debate, but the reality is there was more to it than that. There's all kinds of evidence about the triggering that occurred and why the surge occurred when it occurred because of statements made out of the Department of Homeland Security. This was a surge that was triggered deliberately out of the, this administration. This was not just them reacting to a humanitarian crisis. That's complete nonsense. Next question from here, yes. My question, I'm Kai Albert, Port Angeles, Washington. My question relates only to laws that do not directly impact presidential powers. To those panel members who believe that a president can selectively not enforce certain of those laws, uh, what are the policy implications of the policy yo-yo we're setting ourselves up for if every president does this? Let's say this president does it with immigration. Next president might decide not to enforce the Voting Rights Act and the Clean Air Act. Four years later, administration changes, those acts are enforced, some others are not enforced. Don't we be, get a completely dysfunctional government if every administration does this? Uh, to those panel members who do not believe that the president has or ought to have that authority, how does one effectively stop it when it happens? As was pointed out, impeachment is a very blunt tool. Supermajority required to convict has never actually been achieved in 200 years. What if any other remedies are there, or can a president do whatever he wants until the next election and he's voted out of office? I think the question is too overgeneralized. I agree with uh, Professor Schrader about the, the problem of criminal law. For one, one thing, I've tallied the criminal laws, federal criminal laws, and just in the uh, U.S. Code, it's at least by now 5,000 crimes, not counting those in the regulatory part. There's no way any administration could enforce all of these laws. And in fact, the problem is that Congress passed these things. And they passed them often with no intention that they ever be enforced. They didn't care about that. And this was, this was driven heavily by Republicans since 1970. So you have to distinguish that situation from priorities, as Professor Schrader said. Every administration is going to have its priorities. And you will see a shift in the Civil Rights Division, as he said, in the Justice Department. And that's perfectly within the, the discretion of the president, as long as the statutes are written the way they want, uh, are. If Congress wants to restrain the discretion of the president, they're supposed to do what separation of powers encourages them to do, write the statute tightly so that it will be actually administered the way you want it administered. The reality is many members of Congress don't care how it's administered until somebody squawks about it. They don't, we know, read the statutes. So how do they know how it's going to be administered? Thank you very much. Let's go over here to the side. Hello, uh, Matt from Ocean, New Jersey. Um, one of the things that struck me is that we often forget, but Panama Refining Company v. Ryan, and this goes to what they're doing across the hall too, but Panama Refining Company v. Ryan and Schechter Poultry Corp, 
the United States were never explicitly overruled. And they were meant to cabin the president's discretion, but they've coexisted side by side with a lot of New Deal cases to the point where we have, I think, general chaos as to what the president's powers are or the limits of the president's power in executing statutes. And w what I find with this administration... Are we, are we headed to a question? We are headed to a Great. question. Great. Okay, good. What's, what's your opinion as to why the president can selectively not just have disagreements over plain, uh, plain meaning of statutes, but as he's done with Obamacare, selectively enforce when certain mandates are to be enforced or when certain constituent parts of the law are to be enforced. And if you agree that he can do that, is not the problem the fact that the law was passed giving the Department of Health and Human Services a wide swath of discretion to do, this, to do the same? Who would like to take that? Well, the Treasury example is an interesting one uh, because I'm not sure his current legal justification on, on deferring the employer mandate deadline stands up. I just don't have enough information to know. In, in fact, he didn't rely on prosecutorial discretion in that case. He relied upon the general organic act of the Internal Revenue Service, which has a kind of umbrella provision that the IRS has the authority to issue regulations to implement the code. And as I look at that from a standing start, it's not at all clear to me that includes the authority to su suspend the operative date uh, of uh, the initiation of a tax liability. Now, the Treasury Department will point you to, what, half a dozen instances over the last 30, 35 years in which they've used this authority to defer the effective date of a tax in situations they claim are analogous to this. That is, they start to implement a new tax, discover that there's something complicated about it that is going to make triggering the effective date just on that date difficult either for the IRS or for taxpayers, and so they extend the operative date for some period of time within the range of what they've done now. And they claim they've got that authority under the statute. It's not at all clear to me that a court would sustain that interpretation of that regulation. There was a case uh, in the district court here that was argued last week on this very thing, and, and the first claim by the plaintiffs is that the president has violated Section 3 in terms of faithful execution. And the argument is, as we all know, is by suspending the mandate for some and not for others, it raises his insurance costs. It would be interesting to see whether they get over the standing hurdle. If they get over the standing hurdle, then we'll find out. Yeah, and just uh, with respect to the way the question was framed, the larger point, uh, it's an issue really of whether Congress will play its institutional role. Of course, things like the non-delegation doctrine essentially leave it to Congress and the White House to work it out, as John Baker was saying earlier. And if you were troubled by the state of things, you need to put pressure on Congress to uh, write tighter laws and to uh, oversee the executive branch in a more comprehensive way because the courts are leaving it to the political process to resolve these matters. Thank you. Yes. Ilya Soman, George Mason University School of Law. Uh, I guess my question, probably to the, to the entire panel, is whether there's a meaningful difference between non-enforcement and suspension. Because as you've all, many of you have correctly pointed out, non-enforcement happens all the time. For example, virtually no administration enforces marijuana possession laws on college campuses. The last three presidents all have reason to be grateful for that forbearance. Uh, but <laughs> with respect to the Obamacare case, at least some of what the administration is doing may be going beyond that. They're not merely saying if you don't obey the employer mandate or in some case the individual mandate, we won't go after you. They're saying uh, it's actually legal for you not to obey it until 2016 or until some other uh, point in time. And that, is, I think, is different from what he did on immigration. It's different from the, the marijuana case I just mentioned, uh, or at least it could be different. So is there a difference between saying merely we're not going to go after you and saying you have not violated the law, which at least as I read it is what they have said in the uh, individual and, or employer mandate situations. Thank you. Well, I mean, th th there is a difference between the two. You know, one deals with the question of uh, having your priorities in terms of how you're going to use your budget, how you're going to use your resources, you have a limit to what you can do, and the other is a, a formal announcement basically that you think the law should be rewritten by you. Um, I, I do think, uh, I want to say one more thing about uh, a point that Neil made. Uh, 
and that is that when he talks about the uh, desuetude of the uh, non-delegation doctrine, I think that, that emphasizes the importance of not deferring excessively to administrative decision making. And I would not be surprised to see the way Chevron is implemented change over the next few years as people come to grips with the fact that if you both have a uh, doctrine that allows free form delegation and a total or near total uh, deference to whatever comes out of the administration, you have a, a real shift in power from what was uh, originally intended. Ilya. A good example of the limits of what the executive branch can do was shown on the marijuana situation when the marijuana dealers in Colorado tried to bank their money. And the banks wouldn't touch it because that would violate the law. And the administration tried to tell them, well, we won't prosecute you. Well, wait a minute. You may not be in office through the period of the statute of limitations. So. <laughs> That's the flip side of this. There are certain restraints that they can't get around, but they try. <clears throat> Thank you. Yes, sir. Sure. Roman Bueller with the Madison Coalition. And I just have to say that I was a committee counsel for Congress for 14 years, and we wrote a piece of a statute, and I sat in the first meeting of a commission where they decided to completely violate the statute, and nobody did anything about it. My question to you is, if you look at this as a problem, as some of you talked about, of abuse of presidential power, do, would it help uh, to at least somewhat constrain executive power if Congress had to approve major new federal regulations, either because Congress passed a law or because in the same way that two-thirds of the states forced, or the states forced Congress to propose the Bill of Rights, uh, states got together and forced Congress to propose a constitutional amendment to require that regulations be approved by Congress? There, there is a proposal, the RAINS Act, floating around to do that. What do you think of it? That's my question. I mean, the, the, the simple answer is the more you require congressional involvement, uh, the more you bring things back to the uh, original assignment of powers. On the other hand, if you set the threshold too low, you get into a situation that's like automatic sunset. You, you have them exempted all the time if the, the threshold is at a point where it's just going to be too much of a bother to look at the law each time, the regulation each time, the proposed rule each time. So if you have a high enough threshold, you have a serious enough look at it, uh, yes, it changes the dynamic. Great, thank you. Yes, sir. Hi, this is John Meyer, Arlington, Virginia. And I, I have a question about a what you, you think Congress could reasonably do about the impending executive order, the, the really big one that, uh, that we see in, in the papers where they're gonna legalize 4.5 million people and, 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 and do a bunch of other things. And as was said, impeachment is excessive uh, and won't work without support from the other party, uh, even if it should be done. And the power of the purse is there, but you know, then you'll have a government shutdown and all these problems. It's probably what needs to be done, but uh, what I'm interested in is your idea of another alternative, which would be the alternative of Congress defending its prerogatives by passing a concurrent resolution, which cannot be vetoed. It's, uh, it's simply an action of both houses of Congress declaring that either the whole executive order or most of it is a usurpation of legislative power, is null and void, and then perhaps giving it, Congress saying we will pursue this by the, the means that, that, are, that we, we have. But the, the key idea is that this concurrent resolution could be done, done quickly, and lay down a clear marker that uh, this isn't a constitutional in Congress's view, undermine any legitimacy it may have. And what do you think, and in particular, I'd ask uh, uh, Professor Baker. Well, it's not gonna happen until early January anyway, which yeah. is gonna be too late in terms of stopping the actual action, which is contemplated next week, according to a leaked report today. And then the, the problem with resolution is, wait a minute, what's the effect of a resolution? Is it law? It's not law. It hadn't been up for veto. Is it going to be vetoed? I mean, 
So sometimes Congress will pass resolutions when they don't want to do anything, but they want to tell the voters they've done something. So I don't think much of resolutions. Yeah. It's about power, <laughs> and the power is in the money. And uh, Ryan and others have said, you know, we're going to stop you from implementing this through the power of the purse. That's about the only thing they have at this point. So you wouldn't think it would be good as an opening shot? <laughs> it's, it's one of those feel-good things that don't have, I mean, look, if the president's going to sit in a meeting with them and thumb his nose at them, do you think a resolution is going to change his mind? I don't. Yeah, and the president also claims he has lawful authority to do this. So if a new Congress says, we think the law is different than you think the law, the president can essentially say, that, well, that's a new law that I could veto. Uh, but I do have lawful authority until the law changes. I mean, that would be the view of the president, I think. Thank you. Yes, sir. Uh, I am François Hébriard, uh, the Federalist Society chapter in Paris, the, the city that uh, Thomas Jefferson liked very much, as you know, <laughs> uh, for its monuments and its ladies, too. <laughs> um, I, I have been a, a non-American observer of the American Constitution for 25 years, and I have two questions related to the panel, and I want to thank the panelists for such a great discussion. It made uh, me think of our president, by the way. I don't know which one is the worst. Uh, <laughs> but anyway, I have two questions. The first one is about uh, the word faithfully. The word faithfully is both in the take care clause and also in the oath of office. So my question is uh, simple. Is the meaning the same to you? And my second question is about the misuse of powers by the president in our country any citizen can sue the president uh, before the Supreme Court, pretending he or she uh, is misusing uh, his powers. This is what we call the détournement de pouvoir. Uh, is there any uh, uh, way uh, of that nature in uh, your country to uh, challenge the uh, decisions of the president? Thank you. Well. As for the first question, I think faithful means faithful. It means it's supposed to be an execution of the laws as written. It's not supposed to be an execution of the laws on different terms. Um, of course, all of the, the action is in figuring out how that actually works in practice. Um, as to the, the second question, uh, there is no uh, exact analog to the cause of action you have in France, you, you need standing, you need a, a direct injury, you need uh, a particular uh, action that is being challenged uh, either under uh, the terms of the Administrative Procedure Act or some other particular grant of authority to hear the case. So it's a, a little different, but there are avenues for challenging an awful lot of the administrative decisions here, and I'm glad to have you here with us. Thank you very much. Kristen McDonald, Burn Maynard and Parsons in Houston. Um, recently in Texas, a Representative Krauss challenged an action of the administrative branch, but the judge stopped the case and said, because you don't have the particularized injury we're talking about, only your right to vote was taken away while Congress was out of session, the administrative branch was pushing this new, um, it was gambling in Texas and Texas race parks. While they were pushing that through, and all the members of Congress were saying, wait, wait, no, we want to vote on this. We want the opportunity to discuss it in the House. And, and they couldn't. And then the judge said, I, I'm sorry, the ability to cast a vote is not a particularized injury. And Professor Devins, when you were speaking, you were saying Congress needs to protect itself. And, and so knowing recently in Texas, you know, we can't, knowing that at the Supreme Court level, Congress has been told we can't, what can they do? Well, um, I mean, so the availability of the courts and the standing of lawmakers is quite constrained from the Reigns v. Byrd case, the circumstances by which lawmakers can challenge uh, executive action or acts of Congress for that matter. Um, so they have to do it through the legislative process, right? They have to, uh, you know, 
get together as an institution, pass a law, or restrict executive branch initiatives through appropriations measures. Uh, uh, and the courts do not want to play that role, uh, going back to a point that John Baker made, that a lot of these matters are between Congress and the executive, with the courts not playing a role in standing as one of the ways that uh, the courts uh, free their hands of a lot of these disputes. But isn't there an issue that when the issue actually make it, makes it to Congress, like let's say the you know drug use goes through while Congress is out of session and Congress can't call itself back into session and if they want to overturn it, don't they know that now we're up against a two-thirds vote? The president has big advantage when uh, this is why executive orders essentially uh, do not get repealed by Congress because it requires a supermajority, and uh, I, there was a study by political scientists uh, Terry Moe and uh, Bill Howell, which suggests that essentially whenever, whenever the president uses his unilateral authority through executive orders, um, it's almost never that Congress will be able to override that, and uh, that's why the presidency is so strong, and with polarization in particular, uh, Congress seems relatively weak, and presidential power seems to be expanding and expanding from administration to administration. So essentially, Congress can't protect itself. Congress well. gave away its power, and now they're regretting it. Well, that's the final word. Yeah. So, <laughs> join with me in thanking our panel. Off to the dinner. That's good. Uh, I appreciate it. Thank you very much.